Hi, good morning everyone and welcome back. I hope you had a good tea break. Uh, so now we are going to start with our panel, which is uh, on the cross-generational differences at work. So we'll be hearing from our two esteemed speakers first before we proceed to the Q&A session. But some administrative instructions first. We will be having our floor mic set up across the room. So if you are interested in asking a question uh, verbally, please step up to the mics later when I give the cue. Uh, we also have the Q&A online, so you can also pose your questions there. So moving on proper, the first two online days, we have been listening a lot on structural factors and different ways that the organizations can help uh, to uh, adapt to how work is like right now and will be like in the future. But today in this panel, we'll look a bit more at the individual perspective and we'll take a look at how old, uh, young and not so young workers uh, can adapt to uh, the new environments. So I have with me two esteemed speakers, uh, Mr. David Chua, he's the CEO of National Youth Council, and he will be sharing with us the perceptions of young workers. We also have here Professor Pauline Strawn, she's a professor of sociology at the School of Social Sciences at SMU, and she also heads the Center of Research on Successful Aging. So she will be sharing with us the perceptions of the not-so-young workers. And first, we'll uh, take a look at uh, the perceptions of the young workers. So, uh, David, please. Hello, good morning, everyone. I am from the National Youth Council. And I'll, for the first part, I'll just share with you six insights <coughs> that we have from our data uh, about uh, young people and what they say about the aspirations. So, there are only six points, and I want the, the first three are that first uh, growth, learning new skills, and career success are consistently high. What you see on the left is a time-based series we call the National Youth Survey. We've done it for over a decade, and they rank consistently high. So that's, that's for the first point. The second one is that they aspire to jobs, uh, which offer a lot of development, and also financial security. And that's coming from our longitudinal survey that we do with IPS. And that's been running since 2017. So we are currently in our final wave year six of this panel of young people. Uh, the top three criteria, they always state uh, opportunities for advancement, uh, whether the job offers security, and also more recently, things to do with meeting their bread and butter issues. But we've also seen an increased signal of what they deem to be important in terms of work-life balance, as well as finding meaning in their jobs. So that's coming on more as we see uh, in the longitudinal data that's uh, coming out from the panelists. Now, this correlates quite nicely with the earlier IPS findings. Uh, and you can see that if you, you try and relate to some of the priorities, they're all in the top bucket, ranging from one to seven. So the triangulation here is quite strong. The second three insights uh, border on what they also highlight in terms of their uncertainties with regard to jobs and their future, whether there's sufficiency of opportunities, uh, whether they feel a sense of discomfort in terms of the competition from foreign talent and maybe uh, perceive irrelevance of their skills and knowledge when they graduate, so whether they can keep up with that. They are also looking for alternative pathways and whether that has increased acceptance uh, from society at large. So that urge to find something different, to do something that's off the conventional path. And the final one is that they are also looking for more development and support. And there are three areas here. Uh, one is to have opportunities to remain employable and relevant. But the second one would be of interest to all of us, and that's in terms of career guidance and mentorship. And then also that relates to what they would hope to be able to get in terms of switching and pivoting uh, either jobs or industries. So these are the six quick insights I would like to share with you that corroborates the IPS findings. The question for us is, if we just listen to the aspirations and the concerns and we try and match our workplaces to that, that may not actually be enough because the eventual question we want to get to is what kind of workforce do we want for Singapore? And then you need to layer on the sort of attributes, the kind of mindsets and type of values that the workforce holds. 
if we then take that perspective, the question we also ask is, what kind of people are transiting into the workforce? What kind of students are going into the workforce? And so the, the last uh, framework I would just like to share with you is something I use to help myself connect the dots. It is not an uh, absolute framework, but it borrows from some of the thinking out there. And first, maybe it's good to look at the motivations and the states of minds of who, where these people are at, whether they are students, youth, or young workers. And they could over be in these four states of mind. And I call it the four states, five modes, because these are the modes of behaviors. And so if we go in a clockwise, left to right direction, the disrupted, threatened state elicits a defense mechanism because they are trying to cope with a blurring of boundaries, for example. There are things which they're uncomfortable with that's causing an, uh, an overwhelming state of distress. And so the mode they're going to is a defense one. And then you have one where people are too comfortable and they are coddled, there's a lot of support given, and so there's no need to actually strive or push. And here you find the people aren't pushing the boundaries, so they coast along. Bottom left, you have a state of mind where it's self-limiting, and you have a state of fragility there. Because of certain things you perceive about yourself, you then limit yourself. So you tend to stay away from things. You shield. You become corseted. Uh, organizations or families become uh, places where they accommodate these perceived weaknesses. And so there's an element of safetyism here. And so the, the mechanism here is protecting. And then there's the other extreme where we go into being overly affirmed, where everything is a good job. There's too much praise. And so there's an inflated sense of confidence and entitlement. And then you have people that kind of bulldoze their way around. The place you want to be is in the discover zone. Uh, the discover zone is somewhere in between, and it's hard to get to. But here's a zone where perhaps, whether in schools or in the workplaces, a bit more free and unsupervised time is needed. Some autonomy and empowerment is useful. And it's also a place where people build social capital and relationships and networks that drive their meaning and their purpose. But coupled with that, if we think about also anchoring a set of values and layering on mentors and coaches, whether they are supervisors or outside your organization, it helps them navigate these four states. The final thing I want to leave with you with is this, that actually our young people <coughs> also have a dilemma. They aspire to a future of work and play. But there's also a thing called the Singapore reality. And that's a very practical thing we have to consider because there's cost of living, there are challenges in establishing your home and family. And how would you navigate that between what you aspire to in terms of your work and play, what you want to do in new industries, new markets, and new ways of work? And so being in this discover zone discovery zone and having a set of anchors and values to guide you and mentors would probably help. And so I leave this framework with, with all of us as something to discuss later. And I'll just hand the time now to my dear uh, colleague, Pauline. Thank you so much, David. Uh, so maybe now we'll hand the time to Pauline who will share with us on the not so young workers. <laughs> Wow, David and I were trying to challenge each other to stay under 10 minutes, and he has won the battle. <laughs> so thank you very much, Janadas, for inviting me. It's always such a privilege to be in this uh, very esteemed forum. Um, everyone, can you see my red socks? Happy Chinese <laughs> New Year. Uh, so let me just get started. I just have four points to share. Um, I want to also congratulate the IPS team uh, they have uh, rendered visible, right, all the rumblings, you know, and aspirations of the different generations of Singaporeans. So as a sociologist, perhaps I'll start off with the notion of work, right? In the first, the, my, my esteemed first panelist jumped straight into the discourse on what is work and, you know, what is emerging work and how do we prepare ourselves for it. Uh, but as a sociologist, I'll take a step back and challenge us to think about work as a social construct. So what, what is it that we talk about when we reference this term work? Does it necessarily have to have economic worth? 
do we have to be paid in order to demonstrate that we are productive? Right? So I'll just leave you hanging there. And of course, the other thing, since we're talking about the generational you know, clashes, what constitutes an older worker? Uh, now that I'm almost going to be, not quite yet, but almost going to be 60, I say, well, 55 is old. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so you know, how do we define? Where do we cut off? Right? Why is under 34 considered young? You know, why is 55 and above old? Is the 55 today the same as the 55 30 years ago? And does it Im implicate what they can do right, in terms of productive engagement? So, sociologically, when we look at why people work and therefore the meaning of work, I think one of the uh, myopic views that we tend to take from a lay perspective is that you work because you have to because you need enough and sufficient for retirement. You need to pay off mortgages and so forth. And that's important. The financial aspect, the tangible aspects of work is of course important. But perhaps, and I, if I could argue, for older um, employees, it's more than just what we pay them. Right? What work represents has very rich and, and irreplaceable t in intrinsic benefits the notion of self-esteem, self-worth, your place in society. Being in, in a conducive work environment keeps you embedded in important social networks and keeps us socially integrated. It promotes your, your psychological well-being to know that you are connected with others, particularly others who may challenge you, but by and large are you know, sharing similar aspirations. And of course, and in a very capitalist society like ours, work has very important cultural meanings. When you are working, you are deemed to be important, significant, and you have a place in society. But the moment you stop working, you start to doubt your self-worth. When I was actively involved in um, research on, 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 on parenting, when we interview homemakers, very often the mothers will say, oh, I'm just a homemaker. What an understatement of their value, right? So similarly for older adults, the moment we retire, there's a sense of displacement. What happens to us now? Can we continue to allow that kind of misperceptions to continue? So to derive a, a meaning of work from, you know, from a grounded perspective, let me just allow me to introduce you a little bit to ROSA. So ROSA is a center for research on successful aging. Um, Matthew Matthews is a very important member of ROSA. So ROSA is not just an SMU enterprise. You know, we have very, very important uh, collaborators from NUS, Duke at US. Um, and we are here to share data. So I wanted to use this opportunity to let everyone in the room know that ROSA houses very important data from the Singapore Life Panel. So we are the, oh, I think we are the only longitudinal panel that is representative of the cohorts 55 and above, all the way through 75. And we look at the multidisciplinary dimension of aging, and successful aging is the anchor. So anytime you want data, just, just, just let us know, right? But I think it's very important for us as we continue in this today's discourse to remind ourselves that rather than to work off outdated stereotypes and allow ourselves to be inducted into these outdated stereotypes, we should always remember that we are in a new dawn. Emerging from the pandemic, we need to have new paradigms and perspectives to guide us. We say we are an aging population, but the post-55 today is not the same as the post-55 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. So to move forward, we must be guided by evidence. So just a little bit of tidbit from Rosa. We asked our respondents, when do you prefer to retire? And the mean is, well, we can continue to productively work and contribute till we are at least 70. 
And we expect that this number will shift. Right? And then we ask, what stopped you, you know, from receiving your re-employment contract and what bugs you? And so, you know, these are the four pointers. Nobody is surprised. However, the important academic question here is not that these pointers are there, but to question why. Why is it that we need to act on reducing remuneration, changing work hours, etc.? Um, is that the only way forward as we learn to receive older workers back into the labor force? An important question to also ask is, why is it that from the old, older workers' perspective, right, a change in duties and responsibilities is so daunting? How is that change affected? Are conversations being held to, 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 to facilitate a smooth transit? Right? I think moving forward, it's very important for us to revisit you know, the, the statements that we often hear, you know, headlines, right? Every year when Department of Statistics announced population trends, the first thing we know is you're not having more babies, and the second thing is these are all statistical constructs that are linked to each other. We are an aging population. Are we ready to receive an aging population? We talk about it all the time. For the longest time, when I started as a sociologist in the 1990s working in Singapore, we used that to scare the younger, work, younger Singaporeans into getting married and having kids. Right? But we've been talking like that for like 30, 40, 50 years now. So what have we done to prepare ourselves for this amazing development called a grain population? It means that we've done well. We're not dying. Right? Off, you know, we are not exiting too early, but are we leveraging extended longevity? So I think that we need to look at older adults as assets. If we were not Singapore and we were not as developed as Singapore, we would have lost most of us by the time we hit 50s and 60s. But because we are first world, we now expect to live till we are 90. Those who are post-55 have very rich life experiences, they have enriched perspectives because they have lived through a rich life course, and they are important cultural assets because they remind us why we are Singaporeans. So what are we doing right by them? To leverage our extended life expectancy, we have to bridge the gap between health-adjusted life expectancy and life expectancy so that we are not considered liabilities and dependents, right? I think moving forward, we need to have new paradigms. We need to curate new roles and responsibilities that would take advantage of the value of the mature worker. And of course, now that we've learned you can work out of the office, Take advantage of flexi-work arrangements to provide robust work conditions. And then very importantly, payments, wage, right, disputes. Is remuneration only in the extrinsic form that is value? Might we not think of new ways to reward that goes beyond the dollar value? Notions of respect, prestige, so at Rosa, there's ample evidence to link, this is my final slide, ample evidence to link positive work engagement to holistic well-being. And it is to Singapore's interest that as we live longer, we are able to maintain our post-65ers and post-75ers at, well at a high level of well-being, right? So that we do not have to fear the negative consequences of a growing population. And very importantly, while today's conference is on paid work, that is not the only means of engagement as we focus on older, mature adults. There are other ways of engaging them to remind them that they are important to our society and our community. So how do we unlock these potential cultural and social assets? And my final parting point really is, um, it bothers me no end when we continue for the sake of making headlines to pitch the young against the old, right? We're always saying, 
young workers versus older workers, like today's panel. Uh, we are always thinking about... <laughs> I hope that was for affirmation and not to shut me up. And we're always thinking about a zero-sum game, that when we don't get rid of that older guy, the younger kids cannot rise. We cannot continue to let these outdated frameworks guide us. We are going to go into extinction very soon if we don't get the young people married off and have kids. And one way to do that, to help them promote a good life, work-life balance, is to make sure that we don't unnecessarily exit those older, mature workers who can tilt the balance in their favour. We're going to all live a very long life. There is absolutely no reason for us to fight with each other. So at SMU, I have the privilege of being Dean of Students. Thank you very much, Arnold, for appointing me. And so I look after the young, and I love youths. I love kids, right? No, not, the, not, the, not the spoiled ones, the ones that come to us. <laughs> I absolutely adore our young scholars. And I have the privilege, and again, thank you, Arnold, you know, for supporting the work of Rosa, of working on you know, our uh, project on successful aging. So in the past year, uh, 1992, we successfully morphed the two groups together. So we have young scholars now working on a pilot project with respondents from Rosa, and that intergenerational transfer, it's amazing. As, as researchers, we just watch and observe. And we see how respect, mutual respect, is you know, nurtured when we put them in the right environment, where we highlight how each generation contributes to each other. Right? And they are not in conflict, and they are not contesting for limited resources. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, so at that existential note, maybe we should ask an existential question first. Before I go to uh, all the Q&As, I see things coming in from the online panel, but if you are interested in asking a question, you can also step up to the mics around. But first, let me get my own question in. So I think we have heard a lot about all these aspirations and what different uh, age groups think about work and the meaning of work to them. So uh, in the earlier morning uh, opening speech by our director, there's also a mention of you know, quiet quitting and the great resignation. All these are very related concepts because we are now entering a very new environment, especially post-COVID with the very different flexi arrangements. So how do you think um, this phenomenon actually relates to what you have talked about in terms of the aspirations or concerns of these different age groups? So maybe David first. Okay. Um, I, I like your mention about stereotypes, so quiet quitting is, is probably a stereotype. There are elements of things to unpack from there, but it would be remiss of us to just immediately label. Um, if you go back to the construct that I, I shared earlier, a lot of it comes from the space of being disrupted and threatened. So here there are two camps. One is the young worker, who feels that boundaries have been violated and there's no safe space or trust to voice the concern of how to achieve a sustainable work-life balance. And it could be there's another camp too, the, the employer, who is quite fixated about what work should look like and feels threatened that his perception or her perception of what work should look like is being uh, threatened. So, so here, it's a, it's a space where there is a bit of perhaps organizational dysfunction. And then the question to ask would be, how do we then move from that state of mind to somewhere more positive? And, but you need a process for that. You need a platform. You need the creation of an opening up of communication channels. And, and so these are the processes that we probably need to put in place for that conversation to take place, to shift people who are in that state and who manifest behaviours of quiet quitting and people who go against it to then move in a more constructive realm. I, I agree with you, Dave. I mean, aspirations are a socialised uh, construct, right? So um, I don't think that we should think of them as cast in stone and therefore, you know, um, 
uh, every generation must necessarily fall in that you know, idealized uh, category. But I think my short answer would simply be, what is the role of HR, right? I, I think HR has not, for those of you who are HR specialists, let me apologize ahead. Yeah, you know, there are quite so a that, lot of them. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I am so sorry, you know, I am just a lay person. I'm just observing your, your trait. I'm sure you do it a lot better than what I see. But seriously, what is the role of HR? You can't. HR cannot just be polices of office policies. HR should be advisors and curators of new office culture and, and, and frameworks so that you can actively receive the new cohorts as they come through and as they grow with you and help them to rise to their potential. And I think that if you have an effective HR, you will be able to overcome these frustrations, right? Because simply, my generation, when I was in my 20s, we needed money because my parents were all, I mean, many of us, you know, had parents who were working class and there were a lot of debts to pay and we had to work so that we could contribute to family income. Because we are Singaporeans, now my children are not going to be in the same situation as I was. My children, you know, don't have to pay off mortgages and my children, you know, won't have to pay off as much loans. And so they have that freedom to dream. So HR must learn to receive our younger, you know, workers and help them to realize their dreams. Thank you. So uh, with that, uh, I do not see anyone coming up to the mics. We have a shy audience today, I guess. But we do have a very avid uh, online discussion going on. So I will move on to the online questions. How might organizations put structures in place to build mutual respect between the young and old workers? So I think that's something that Pauline mentioned earlier as well. So I better let David speak. No, 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 no. Go, go ahead. I want to be popular. Yeah. Uh, David, uh, go ahead. You already offended the HR people. So uh, yes, yes, yes. Go ahead help and me, offend help me. <laughs> <laughs> help me, save me. <laughs> uh, no, no, there's no magic here. Uh, I, I think on top of what I mentioned earlier about putting in place processes and having a safe space mechanism for these to surface. And so what you need in your organization are people that can arbitrate and hold that space and bring two sides to a conversation. But you have an additional ingredient which I, I, I sense is lacking in even my, my own organization as well, and it's called patience, strategic patience. You can't solve some of these things immediately. And the, the trust building requires a, a time process. So strategic patience, a lot of forbearance is required. A lot of the change journeys that I, we undertook, uh, we thought we could solve in six months, and I thought it was long enough takes about two years sometimes for that element of trust and for that intergenerational willingness to come together and for some of these transfers that Pauline talked about to happen. Yeah. So I, I'm trying to recover some of my lost favor with HR, right? So, so I do know that there are new processes, processes that have been you know, um, onboarded. For example, we take now very seriously goal setting, right? Um, so we, we, we just need to learn how to make good use of these tools and not treat them as administrative chore. You know, set the goal and then after that everyone forgets about the goal, right? So I think that is one aspect in which we keep that conversation and communication open within an organization. Certainly it's not going to be one size fits all. So that's the one thing that we cannot be looking for. Right? Because we have a diverse workforce, uh, and it's not just a generational difference, it's a cultural difference, you know, you know people are just in different, socialized in different cohorts and so forth. So respecting that we do have a diverse you know, pool out there, uh, how each organization will be able to uh, onboard you know, policies that will, that will help your, 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 uh, you know, your, your, your labor pool rise to their potential, I think leverages a lot on conversations and empowering the leaders to be able to make recommendations, right? And, and have sufficient bite in their recommendations. Um, but you know, perhaps a final note really is how we hire, because if you find the right talent for the right position, they will blossom. 
right? So, so thank God, you know, God guided me to academia, so I, I did okay there. I often think that I have so much respect for civil servants, I probably would have died if I joined the civil service, which was the first job offer I had, right? So, so finding that right talent to the right organization is probably a very good start. So employers, stop looking at GPAs and grades because they are superficial and artificial. That's not the tell-all. We have to learn how to look at the talent right, and the passion of each child we groom, nurture, and graduate, and then place them where they will continue to be loved and nurtured. And I think if we have enough of that going on, we will be okay. Can I, can I just sure. pick on that? Uh, I'm going to say you will not find the right talent for your job more than half the time. Um, and remember, we mentioned about who is coming into your workforce. So the question for organizations will also be, what can you do to shift them into a, a phase where they can discover and learn and grow even whilst they are in your organization? So they're not going to come to you perfect. Mm. And, and the question is, what can you do to steward their growth for the time that they are with you? So that eventually the final end state is Singapore gets a good workforce. But for the time that they're with you, whether they're at the front end, the middle, or toward the end, can you do something that helps them grow, learn, contribute meaningfully, as we spoke about? So, I, I mean, it's really tough to, to hire right uh, and sometimes our perception of what is the right fit actually differs from... And we go into the whole equation with the wrong expectations. I hired you to do this, and you didn't do this. Why? I mean, that's not, that's not what I, I hope. Uh, not the kind of transactions mm -hmm. I would like to get from a staff or employer. Yeah. So... Hello. Yeah, hi. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Tambaya from the uh, medical school. I asked this question of the union chief uh, last week, um, and he said uh, it was not exactly a union question, so maybe I'm interested in an academic take on this. Uh, this relates to the narrative that we're expected to keep working uh, longer and longer into our life, uh, lifespan. So I asked him this question about who would be comfortable being operated on by a 70-year-old neurosurgeon or being in a bus driven by a 70-year-old bus driver and uh, to my mind, uh, there has to be a point in time where, where we have to say we can stop working, we can collect a pension, we can take a long dream of vacation or pilgrimage, we can start looking after grandchildren. And, and the question is, why can't we, who have, you know, amongst the highest uh, social security payments in the world, we put in like 40% of our income every month, uh, have a portion of that set aside to a pooled uh, pension? Uh, so I'd just be interested in your views on that. Thank you. Well, so, Paul, I, I don't think we can address the pension issue. That's beyond my capabilities. But I will talk about, you know, the notion of a 70-year-old doing A, B, C, or D, right? I mean, very, you know, just tongue-in-cheek. A 70-year-old is not the same as another 70-year-old and another 70-year-old. So, so one of my difficulties is we pin a chronological age to a stereotype and then we treat everyone in that age group the same way. We should stop doing that. But I do agree with you that we should not live just to work. We should work to live, and then to live a very good life after. So that is why I think we need to rethink how do we engage our citizens productively, right? Is paid work the only kind of activity that we will valorize and put a tick next to? There are other, you know, there, there are many, the ways communities work so well in Singapore because of the, the, the labor of many, many volunteers. And these are all silent workers. These are the people who would love your neighbors, who would you know, go and you know, do your, 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 your distributions for you and so forth. So, might we not then learn how to value such contributions? And in doing so, we will encourage the baby boomers who are crossing over to 65 and, and, and onwards, we will encourage them to think beyond holding on to that labor that we are so familiar with in paid work, and then happily embrace the next labor, which need not 
have a remuneration attached to it, but will have prestige attached to it. And, and I guess finally, Paul, what, what the Singapore that I dream of will have one that has options, right? For both young and old, to have options, and we will all be valorized for our unique contributions. And, and, and as, pa as David says, and for, particularly for the younger ones, that we will be patient, right? And allow the young to morph into, you know, uh, an adult stage, you know, into roles that they will honour, and every role is important in our small country. David? Uh, my, my thought to that is that actually it's, it's probably a, a, a way of how we ascribe value to an older worker. I think there are realities we all will have to acknowledge at some point, at some point when I am 70 or so, I have to acknowledge that my cognitive and physical abilities are limited. Uh, and so then the question will be, what value can I bring? And certainly there will be value adds that an older person can bring, even from a, a young perspective, not, not mine, but what I'm hearing from young people, for example, are that they love to hear and, be re and to be mentored by people like you with, who have experience in your belts. And, and also there is a, a way of maybe for organisations to rethink some of these roles. You talk about new roles for older people. Could we in our organisations redesign the job descriptions or roles and, and carve these out for an older worker to, to add value uh, in a different way? So I think we have to recognise that there are some realities that we have to grapple with and that there are new innovations we can bring into the workplace to, to allow them to continue contributing. Yeah, so, so, the new, so, so that's why I said, are we prepared for an ageing you know, uh, population? And that would require us to, have, to identify new needs and not just building hospitals and, 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 and ageing homes, right? but also new needs of this, this silver economy. Right? How, how are we leveraging? You know, are we doing anything right, to, to leverage all the, all, all the enormous potential in the silver economy? Um, so when, when, when COVID just ended and I had the privilege of travelling, uh, it was so chaos in other countries. But when we arrived in Singapore, the online forms were so complicated. But the minute we touched down and we walked through Changi Airport, there was no confusion because every step of the way, we were guided by a smiling ambassador who guided us from station to station, and it was the smoothest re-entry ever. And I looked at the ambassadors because we chatted with them. Many of them were older, so I don't know whether they were paid or they were just you know, volunteers, but that was amazing that we could you know, leverage this important pool who were able to engage you know, returnees and visitors as we entered through you know, immigration. And then such a nice warm welcome back to Singapore. So I think it's really fitting the ability and skills to the right job rather than you know, eliminating one group or you know, bringing one group in totally. So I think I see a gentleman over there. We can take the question and I'll ask another question from the online uh, portal before we uh, get your responses. Please. There's a union guy. That's yes. <laughs> I'm not so sure if... Uh, okay. good, good. Let me check the time. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm actually a union leader from power and gas industry. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not responding to what my second has actually explained earlier. Uh, first, I want to thank the panel for actually reminding the HR of their role. It's not about policing what are the policies and about appraisals or what. Indeed, it is true. Eh? Uh, the role of HR should be beyond preparing the workforce of tomorrow. And your workplace ambassador is people like myself, the union leaders. We understand the workers' lingo. We even to the extent that the labor movement, we dare not call old workers old. We call them mature because we don't want to, uh, some would say, discriminate or humiliate, because they are still contributing. But to be fair, not all HR are actually type of policing. So it is how, if your company is unionized, the HR can work with the unions together. I have an example of a company whereby we know the demographic of workforce is aging. Engage the union, sit down, because we know what the workers think, we observe what the workers do, and we want them to continue because of their rich life experience, because of their job knowledge. My question is, how do I then, uh, can you give us tips to actually nudge our HR partners to ensure that they don't just be uh, 
stigmated in terms of just, okay, your work is just, this is my HR policy, we talk about appraisal, CA, you know, just like the unions. The unions is not about your wages or, or what, okay, but it's about beyond workplace ambassador, work, take care of workplace issues. That is part of work-life balance. And the unions will continue to do our job to advocate because this is what we feel and we take care of those even at the younger age up to the day that you are actually uh, exiting workforce. Right? Unions is not about social welfare. That's why I don't use the whole NTUC a lot because people will link us to food fair, kopitiam. It is the unions of today which you see is different, but end of the day, our outcome is still the same. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, how to nudge the HR industry or, you know... I think he help, gave us the answer already. Help Have the a HR, union. Yeah. Right? <laughs> how to help the HR industry find meaning in their jobs. So uh, maybe uh, before you two respond to that, I'll also include another question, which is slightly uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum. Because the top voted question now is saying that given we see a lot of passion ploitation or flexi ploitation or work is a family nowadays, how can we ensure fair conditions and wages without exploiting meaning? Hmm. Well, that's a complicated say, say that again. Uh, Sexploitation. So, yeah, so basically all the exploitations of all these uh, terms and you know all the sexy uh, terms recently. Uh, how can we ensure that people are being treated fairly in terms of remuneration mm. and wages? So if you move away from traditional face time and clocking, that's how you will arrive at a fair, you know, um, reward system. So we we were learning how to do that before COVID, right? Um, because flexi work could only succeed if we learn how to set KPIs and assess KPIs, also out output-based evaluation rather than you know quantifiable kind of clocking in, clocking out, and FaceTime. So you, when you rely too much on FaceTime, pe people tend to overwork, right? And 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 not ne not necessarily that they have to work, but because they're too afraid to leave before the boss leaves. Right. So that's very very unhealthy. And then COVID came. Many bad things came with COVID, but the silver lining there is we suddenly realized that all those barriers you know, and excuses that we made about not having flexi work arrangements was thrown out the window. And if you didn't trust your employees, you'll be out of business now, right? We all had to learn how to work with our colleagues and trust that even though we don't see them at their cubicles or their desks, that they are exercising discretion and delivering outcomes. So it is really about teaching supervisors how to set fair KPIs and then learn how to assess outcomes, particularly not individual outcomes alone, but teamwork. Because we also learned that one of the pain points of COVID when we worked from home is that teamwork aspect failed. <laughs> so we had loners who became loners and then became isolated and then became very sad, right? So how do you, you know, ensure that when you are assessing a team, that's where you need to be fair and you yes. need to be able to, you know, I think generate that kind of confidence in employees that their work will be recognized and their contribution will be, you know, uh, credited to them. Right. Uh, so just three things maybe to the two questions. Uh, and the first is that uh, HR is not the purview of HR. HR is the purview of leaders. So every leader, you are beholden and you have the responsibility to develop, grow, and take care of all the HR issues of your people. It's not just HR. HR is there to help you and navigate some of the structural uh, complexities, but this is our responsibility. So that's one. The second is that uh, if then indeed it is the role of leaders, then it's incumbent on leaders to establish channels to communicate where the boundaries are to overcome things like your flexi poetation. There's even a trend going around called quiet hiring where you know, those who are very keen to take on more work are quietly hired, do on more work and therefore gain a higher assessment. So as leaders, you probably need to put in place mechanisms to communicate these expectations, as you said, set KPIs and how you want to assess outcomes of work fairly. Uh, so that's two. Number three, the role of the union is, is not just in representing the voice of the worker. 
you would add value to an organization when you come to an organization, not just as a representation of that voice, but if you are a more neutral party and you're prepared to bring all views to the table. So the role is further enhanced when you are that sort of neutral negotiator to bring both sides to a best outcome. And, and if that's, that would be the case, then organizations would be more willing to come to the table and, and work toward a uh, amenable outcome for everyone. So, so that's, that's a difficult place to, uh, space to do. And so I applaud and, and um, appreciate the efforts of the union. And I know it's not easy, but I think if you continue to strive there, you will do better. At the risk of being more unpopular with my HR friends, I mean, David is not wrong. If you're an owner of a small SME and a small organization and unit, I think you, should, you have to be hands-on, right? To be, you know, cognate with your, 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 your team. But in a larger organization, it's really hard. You know? I mean, employers and leaders at the very top have to have an open mind. But HR really is your eyes and ears on the ground. I mean, unions are very, very important. Um, and, but you know, unions are not everywhere. So HR really is your gatekeeper. So HR could either say, you're doing great, boss. Same old, same old. Just tell me what you want me to do. I'll do it. Or HR could say, hey, you know, we're heading into uh, you know, new territories and this is what we need to do. We're receiving a new cohort of older you know, or younger you know, um, employees and these are their needs and this is what we can do better and this is what they can bring to the table. So we need to tweak A, B and C. That's the role of HR. Huh? I love you, HR. You're so <laughs> important. I'm valorizing your presence in your organizations. Yes, you are helping them to find more meaning in their work then. So I think we have another question here. Are you HR? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm Carol from the Institute of Policy Studies. Thank you, Pauline and David. Um, so I would like to direct my question to a group of people that we have not really spoken about. Um, I think, David, you alluded to them. So they are neither the young nor the old. They are neither the employers or the employees. I'm talking about the intermediaries, right? People like... Uh, who are doing the work of job matching, career counselling, mentoring. So in your observation of the space, how adequate do you think this group of people are in our current employment landscape? And what policies or programmes do you think need to be put in place to strengthen the competency of this very important group of people? Thank you. So, so you're talking, Car uh, Carol, eh? right? Carol, about... Um, for example, the career centers. Um, they're so important, and I think many have not yet arrived at their potential. Um, and, and the difficulty really, perhaps is our fault uh, in academia, right? Because uh, we generate that one tell-all GPA. And so employers who are receiving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications tend to focus on the GPA. And then suddenly the discourse is, how do we encourage our students to do better? at school, rather than say, how do we encourage our students to learn how to identify their strengths, their passion, and, you know, try to match them with an aspiration, you know, try to match them with, with an organization um, or a space where they can uh, grow in their aspiration through their careers. So we're learning how to do that. So we need to give the career coaches tools, right, on our side, from the school side. Right, so that they can look at those tools and say, ah, I can see that you are passionate about animals. So let's see if we can place you in the right space and so forth. So that's one. And we are working on that. So join us on the 6th of April. We will have an announcement from SMU. Okay? Now, the other aspect, of course, is really, again, you know, I think the, the, the recruiters and, and the placement officers, you're all very important because you are the bridge, the gateway, right? Particularly from those who are seeking to where the opportunities are. So again, I think each of us, I get very excited when I talk about this, we have to realize and unlock our power of agency. We are not potted plants in the space that we are in, no matter what your job station is. So if you are in that space where you have that power to advise employees, employers where the talent is and advise you know, 
potential applicants where they could place and invest their careers, then you need to advocate for that. Right? So, so, so I think if everyone realizes that we are not just a part a machine, you know, of the machinery, that, that gear, that functional gear that just keeps moving, you know, the, the, the conveyor belt on, then things would really become a lot better. So each of us should realize that we should be advocate for the people whom we work with, for the people whom we work for. Because, you know, you know it's not just HR, right? It's all of us, right, who have a voice and who have observations. And, and we need to be able to have that safe space to communicate this effectively and efficiently. Yes, I think value the individual experience as well, mm. right? Yeah. So, David, any comments? On yeah, thanks, Carol, for that question. Um, it is a very important space, and if we look at the data of what young people would like, actually, they are looking for mentorship and coaching. Uh, there, there are two, two aspects here. So, one is unlocking the power of agency, but it's also to help the person make better choices amidst a lot of uncertainty and dilemma. And it would be necessary to, to have these people to help move people into that space that I described, the discover space, so that there's a sense of agency, sense of curiosity, empowerment, and freedom to learn and grow. There are three challenges, though, uh, skills. So it's not just a, I like to mentor and can I mentor you? I mean, it can happen, but actually for you to be a better mentor and coach, there's a little bit of training required to un so that you can help to unlock the, the person's potential. So skills are needed, and for skills, you need to take time to learn and to acquire. Uh, the second is that we do need more space for that, and by space, I don't mean physical space. I mean that within the organizations, whether it's a school or workplace, we need to create formal space that this is an area that's needed and time and resource is required. So creating that capacity for mentoring to happen. And then the third is that actually it's also hard to orchestrate and we need to recognize that, that the matching of mentor-mentees has an element of serendipity. And, and so it's not like I can, Pauline, you talk to KK and carry on, okay? Uh, we've tried that before and it doesn't always work. So some, some element of uh, fluidity is also required somehow. So it's a very complex space. I have no perfect answer for this. But I do know that at least from the national perspective, even at MCCY and NYC, we know that this is an important lever to exercise. But we can't come at it at being too structural and top-down. Neither can we leave it to a complete thousand flowers bloom. And so here's where I would encourage us to, to have a harder go at this, whether you're in HR or whether you're a leader, uh, whether in the public sector or private, I think it is a space to exploit, to help us get the kind of workforce we want for Singapore. So I think in terms of guidelines, more fluidity is the way to go, right? Rather than straight on, I implement A, B, C and let people try and figure their way out around all these rules. So uh, we do have a countdown clock now. So uh, I will combine two questions uh, from the online uh, question and the two of you can take them. So there is uh, one that talks about um, the young value career, uh, career breadth and development, which is fundamentally different from the iron rice bowl that the civil service promises. So how do we bridge this divide or are we doomed to suffer a talent drain? And then there's also another one, which is again the opposite spectrum, talking about uh, the uh, retirement age. So Pauline, in your presentation, you mentioned about how you expect it to increase, right? Because the current uh, survey results show. Uh, but they suggest that maybe the millennials and Gen Xs, uh, Gen Zs might think differently. So uh, just this two. Basically, how to bridge the divide between talent drain in civil service and this uh, career breadth and development, and any ideas on whether the ideas of retirement age would change? Okay, so maybe I'll go first since I can see the question. Yes. My retention power. Oh, well, they, then the question disappeared. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so thank you. Thank you for, for raising that. So precisely, right, because notions of work 
retirement, what you do in your life course, they are socialized aspirations. They are social constructs. And we expect the meanings to change with each cohort, with each set of you know, experiences, particularly global you know, kind of phenomena like a COVID pandemic. So very important then for us to always remember as we receive a new cohort of, let's say, post-40s or post-50s, you know, to do a stock take of what the needs and aspirations are of this group. And if the younger lot now feel that by the time they are in their 50s, they're ready to retire because they have other things they want to do, then that's great, right? Plan ahead so that in, in all these subgroups, you know, you have a very nice, I think, uh, you know, roles that tend to morph and shift but at the end of the day, every group, every subgroup has an important role to play, right? So, so my mother retired when she was 55. This was, uh, you know, she's a nurse, right? She was a nurse. So she's 89 years old now. Thank goodness I had children, right? Because then she, you know, so I was much blessed and she could take on, you know, Paul, like Paul said, people want to, you know, become grandparents. And so, so she raised my two children. And now that she's 89, she's bored because the two kids are all grown up and they don't need her. And then she said, I'm so fierce, so no, not, not, not enough time for her. She wants to play mahjong and then some of her friends are not so well. So you see, that, that's, you know, so, so we learn, right? We learn how to manage different groups um, as they go along. Not everyone will be the same. It's not as, not, not as homogeneous as we hope because for public policy, it's very easy to imagine, you know, a holistic kind of a platform and then you roll out, right? Uh, so I think my, 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 my conclusion is, um, is in the nature of the human spirit, right, that each generation will be different. And we, learn, we need to learn how to, I guess, unlock the potential from each generation and then, you know, support them and nurture them because then Singapore will continue to grow stronger and stronger. I'll take the public domain one. I can assure you in the public service, you will get your breadth and depth of experience and challenges. So I, I, the public service has transformed itself tremendously. Even within the, the people development construct, there's a lot of flexibility and options given to you to not just choose your postings, but you get time to go to the ground. You get seconded out to private sector. There are many avenues for you to expand. The, the difficulty actually is there's a lot of choice. So for, for those of you young people who are considering the public service, we have far moved away from the iron rice bowl notion. Those are, that's, we don't even talk about it. Uh, so the breadth and the depth is there. And I think that's true also for many of the private sector organizations. I think increasingly employers are seeing that the way work is, there's so many blending of disciplines and, and so many kinds of diverse talents and experience sets required, uh, you would get your breadth and depth. So the, the challenge for you is then what choice do you make and how do you make those choices? Are they anchored by certain value sets? Are you operating in the right state of mind when you make those choices? Uh, and do you have people to help guide you, coaches or mentors? Uh, I'll touch a little bit on the, the second question by the, I'm assuming a Gen Z person asked. And I think it speaks to the, the state of mind where you don't want to be bounded and defined by a certain retirement age. And I can understand that you want the flexibility to be able to do what you want to do and you don't want to be told that you need to work until 70. But the, it, it really doesn't matter. So for me, whether the retirement age is 50, 62, 67 or 70, it really doesn't matter. The question is, what can you still do? What is your perception of work at, then, at that time? What is your perception of the value that you can bring? And then that defines your scope of what you want to do, whether you call it work or otherwise. Uh, and then that's how you can gain fully, uh, stay connected to society, into your networks, still gain fully contribute, whether it is volunteer, on a voluntary basis or a paid basis. And, and then actually it doesn't matter what that boundary is. The government sets it in place for certain reasons. Uh, but for you, uh, you can define it the way that you perceive value that you can bring. Yeah. Mm. 
So as you put it, it's probably more of a guideline or for different planning reasons rather than for the individual to fixate upon as a number, right? So uh, with that, I think there's a very relevant question online as well. Just one more online first. Uh, how do we define meaningful jobs? Does it seem, because uh, it seems that uh, based on this person's observation, that some of the most uh, meaningless jobs, I'm not trying to offend anyone, uh, just reading out, uh, for example, finance earns the <laughs> most, while the more meaningful ones, for example, education, are not as well compensated. Maybe we'll take the young person's question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, where's the... Actually, you can ask your question. Do, please do. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, panelists. I am Cheng Kang from Raffles Institution. And I have a question that uh, myself and some of my schoolmates have about aspirations and education. So, um, in your opinions, are aspirations inherent or created? And should we be focusing our efforts on discovering dreams or creating them? And then, based on which approach employers believe in, how should our education and job matching be conducted so that our students are better fitted for the workforce that we wish to create? Thank you. Thank you. He has three points, right? Yeah. So the first is, so I'll, I'll quickly go through and then David, I'm sure, will, will have his perspective. I think aspirations are both socialized and created. Um, and I think that you, it's very difficult to create if you're not grounded first, right? So I think the first step is necessarily you're socialized. So you're socialized by your family, your teachers, and even your peers. And then after which you should stop take and look at the world around you. And especially post COVID, right? I tell my students, wow, it's like you have this white board, you know? Well, when, when I graduated, I had a board with a lot of markings already. But now you have a whiteboard. So what, what do you want to fill on this whiteboard that will add meaning and value, not just to yourself, right? That's the difficulty. If you're always thinking about yourself, then I think then probably you won't get that kind of traction. But it's always wise to work in groups, to always think, how will it benefit my peers or a, a particular segment of population that you, know, you, you find endearing and you want to be you know, their voice? Right? and then chart your aspiration so that you will empower yourself with the pathway that you take to be able to rise to that, that goal right? of being you know, a mover and shaker and an advocate for whatever you strive for. And at the same time, so if you do it right, you will find fulfillment right, in, in your growth and you'll, you'll be very happy. I'm a much happier person now than I am when I first started off because I chose the right pathway. Right? So, so, so that's an that's a important thing to remember. You are not just you know, part of the conveyor belt. You, you curate which pathway you want to go on, but do it in a wise manner. Right? Don't go you know, and you know, like stand outside MOE and protest. Don't do things like that. It, it doesn't get you anywhere. So to advocate for your, for your peers and your group's needs, Learn how to advocate wisely. Find out who can help you in the social space that you are in. And then you learn how to then reshape and influence their perception so that they can understand why you want to do things the way you want to do. And so that, that kind of uh, conversations is extremely important. So that's why in schools, it's extremely important that we learn how to communicate and to be able to convey our, you know, our, our ideas, our proposals and our aspirations in a meaningful form that does not alienate others. Quick one to the point about your aspirations uh, being inherited or created. And like Pauline says, a lot of it's socialized. So actually, I would encourage you to discover your aspirations by exposing yourself to a wider network. Go meet people, talk to people, get outside of RI, uh, go to the ground. I'm an ORI boy anyway, so no offense. Yeah. Uh, get new perspectives, and then you discover your aspirations. Right? So whether they were socialized to you at home or outside, the, the key here is to expose and broaden your horizons. And, and like my instructors tell me, uh, a ship in harbor is safe, uh, but that's not what a ship is for. So get your ship out and find that horizon or that destination that you want to head for. 
uh, for the, the question earlier. Um, uh, meaning. Yeah. So, so yeah. the quick response to that is you can't get everything that you want. You do have to make a choice and accept trade-offs. And I, my final point would be that there's a season for everything. If that season of life requires you to have financial security, then that's your priority, right? And, and so you can't quite, all of us, always have everything that we want at one go, you know, first bite with the cherry. So for the young people out here that are aspiring to many things, you have a lifetime to achieve those. Mm. There is a season in life for everything. So be patient. Thanks. Yeah, so, so again, yes. you know, the kind of jobs that you have, right? Um, nothing, n nothing should be devalued. And, and, and again, you know, those labours are all socialised labours, they are constructs. So if you're in, you know, passionately in a space and you want to draw attention to this space that you're in, do it. Show us what you are doing, what you're contributing, and then the value will toggle accordingly, right? I think you have uh, one more question there, Kathy. Sorry? Yes, uh, that will be the last question. I'm Tiny from the National Institute of Education and I just want to ask is what really the end all be all for dignity because I think um, it seems that the national transition is to go from paid work and then to unpaid work in the form of volunteering your time or your experience and it seems strange to me that your entire value as a person has to be limited by the kind of labor that you do um, so I was just wondering what your thoughts are on, for example, work, for example, caring for your children, which might not be work that's recognized by people outside of your family, but intrinsically still valuable. Is work really the only way we can find value? Yeah, that's it. Well, so I think that given that she's from NIE, that's a very important point of teaching, right? So, so, so sorry, my mind is just still lodged on the previous uh, question. We used to not appreciate our teachers as much. Right? But then you fast forward this from when I was uh, your age or you know, when I was younger in the 1980s and fast forward to now, teachers are doing very well. We've learned to love and valorize our teachers. So again, that journey that we took right, to toggle in position what is important in our society. So, but your, your point is no different from what David and I share, and that is the notion of work, how you define work. It's a definition that begs, you know, uh, I think, uh, in, in intervention from us. We need to teach each other what constitutes productive engagement. It doesn't necessarily have to be paid work, does it? We shouldn't value, you know, the worth of a contribution by how much money you get paid. Instead, it should be the kind of intrinsic contributions as well. And certainly, you know, working invisible work for your family, for friends, for you know, and even, you know, like self-care, that's important work because otherwise if you don't take good care of yourself, then you become a liability to those around you. So we need to define, you know, in a way what we mean when we say work. Um, and you need to teach the academics, right? When you talk about work, are you talking just about paid work? All right, then in which case, maybe don't blow your trumpet so loudly because you don't have the, you know, all-encompassing answer to everything. But certainly you are right. There are other forms of engagement that are supremely important. And you don't necessarily have to volunteer either, but it would be nice if we grew the pool of volunteers. David? I don't have an answer for you, except that I acknowledge there's a tension between what your self-worth is and how you perceive that relates to the value you bring and what society at large perceives to be valuable. So it's something you have to navigate, something our young people navigate all the time, what I deem to be valuable from a personal perspective, from my own identity and self-esteem, and what society and people around me say is valuable. And so you have to hold that tension. No easy answers in Singapore, but teachers like you will need to help the young people navigate. That's right, you're a teacher, so you need to teach <laughs> us, right? I mean, one of the most common things we see, you know, when we meet somebody new is, and I am guilty of this because I'm such a busybody, right? Is, what do you do? Because I'm trying to stereotype this person, you know, by their occupations. So you should teach us. What are the, you know, more important and more meaningful icebreakers, you know, that, that, that we can use so that we stop hanging on to old threads which we don't believe in. Right. which are not so useful anymore. So I think um, 
we do have some time to conclude. And I would just like to bring us back to the original title of our panel, which is cross-generational differences, right? So are there really differences between the old and the young? Uh, you know, how can we balance all these aspirations? Which I think it's also a question that's being asked by uh, one of the participants from the earlier panel. Uh, one of the questions listed there, rather. So uh, how can we bridge the divide? Is it really we are trying to pit, and is that really the only way we can go about doing this? OK, well, because well, it's, it's such an important question, I'm going to jump in first, David. We certainly should not be putting one generation against the next. That's counterproductive. Because in the family, both generations are one unit. right? So it's stupid to do that. Um, I don't think that you can say that there are differences or similarities. I think. Probably the right answer is somewhere there. We share similar aspirations. I've always often been reminded that, all oh, my rambling aside, people still need money. So therefore, you know, financial adequacy is a shared need, regardless of your age. It's, it's, the, it's the how much is enough that varies, right? But there are other aspirations that might be different because, you know, somebody who is my age should not you know, have the shared aspiration as you because I've journeyed along further, right? So therefore, my aspirations would have shifted. And you would have aspirations that are not necessarily the ones I had when I was your age, because I lived in a different time, you know? But what we want is a mutual respect. So it's, to me, not at all helpful. Are there journalists here? I'm going to be so... See, journalists, right? You've got to stop for the sake of headlines, call, 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 calling these young people names all the time. I mean, it went from strawberry to... Still flakes. What, is it durian? Got durian or not? Uh, yeah, okay. Earlier, earlier. And then, and then what else? Uh, mostly Sour strawberries up. now. No, no, no. Okay, so, you did, sour sap. Sour sap, got sour sap. <laughs> but my point is, why do we do that? Because in that one labour, you get the youths up in arms and then they get so angry and then they feel that, oh, these old people don't understand. And it's not fair to us old people because we never had a, a say in that curation. Right? I have to learn the definition. So I think we need to stop that. You know, all these quick labours are sexy for social media, but they're not useful for bringing the community together. Right. So that's my take on it. Right. David? Yeah. Um, we're all in the same boat called Singapore and every one of us is an asset and I think all of us would want to be viewed and treated like that. So if from that perspective you can land, I think we would have synergistic workplaces, there will be intergenerational transfers and we'll all thrive. So there, there are many good things we can look forward to yeah. if we can get our act together. The intergenerational transfers is a very important point because we stand to learn from each other so much, right? I, I, I learn from my students, I learn from the ROSA respondents. So we need to have that healthy respect for each other. Even if we have differing viewpoints, that's fine. That's what makes life exciting, right? Right. So actually, it's more of like respecting all the different viewpoints, respect, trust, and mutually understand each other, right? So yeah. I think these are some common landing points that we can get. Rather than pit uh, the young versus the old all the time or any other different kinds of groups, we are all workers and we should uh, all look at things from the same uh, level. Hey, Kaki. Yes. You're going to talk about this thing called quiet quitting, right? Uh, I think we don't have time now, <laughs> so maybe well, we can move that quitting. to another, pan another panel quite, next time. Quiet quitting is just... I, I, okay, I'll just say one yes. thing and then you can cut me off. Right? I think the organisers are feeling really the stressed too, right really now, careful. so we need to stop. Maybe next time uh, we'll give you another panel of your own to talk about quiet quitting. So thank you very much for being so avid participants, and uh, we'll see you at lunch. <laughs>